when they go to set up the system, they they set up all these all these things. They have they have a technology fee and an application fee and a renewal fee and a trans. I mean, just fee after fee after fee, and they're looking for for them to make money. For and the the only way to start and end this successfully is both have to make money. If the franchisee makes money and the franchisor doesn't, it's going to fail. And if the franchisor makes money and the franchisee it doesn't, it fails. So the greatest franchisees ensure that they get a, a return, a, a excellent return on their investment that includes both time and money. Welcome to the Franchise Hot Seat Podcast, where we talk about all things franchising. Now, here's your host, Dr. John P. Hayes. My guest today, industry legend, John Hewitt. We've been in franchising about the same number of years, but John is an icon. 5,200 plus and counting franchisees in your career, John. You founded several companies, but one of the largest, Jackson Hewitt, you were at the top of one of the one or two top retail chain franchises in the world, more than 10,000 tax offices. You uh, have gone on to found other uh, companies, other franchise companies as well. Uh, today, you have loyalty brands, a, a platform brand that I want to talk about and make sure people understand what that's about. So you have several brands. You have sold twice to uh, uh, public companies. You've sold for seven figures. Where does it all lead and why? Why such a story? Well, where's it leading? Uh, I, You know, when I was a kid, I was uh, I was confident, cocky, and I knew I was going to become a millionaire. I didn't know how. I wasn't rich, and uh, then I thought I'd make a few million dollars and retire. Yeah. And along the way, I found out that the treasure at the end of the rainbow is anticlimactic. It's the journey that's the joy. So I, you know, I'm a life master bridge player and master chess player and. But there's nothing I do enjoy as much as changing lives. So um, I'm I'm in this forever. They got to kill me to stop me. <laughs> All right. So uh, most recently, loyalty brands. So a lot of uh, for whatever reason, everybody has different reasons. A lot of franchisors have decided one brand isn't enough. Um, Neighborly, maybe the largest, has something like 35 brands, all geared toward home services. Gigantic industry, attracts lots of franchisees. You are usually, they are lower cost franchise opportunities. Uh, you have loyalty brands. First of all, why? Why did you go that route? Before it was Jackson Hewitt, then it was uh, Liberty Tax. Uh, you concentrated in tax preparation. You did a great job there. You sold both of those companies, uh, public companies, and you sold them both for tons of money. Now you have ATAX. Why not just ATAX? Why, why do you need multiple brands? Yeah, the, um, both of the, my first two companies, Jackson Hewitt and Liberty, I sold for about $500 million, or they yeah. became worth $500 million. And uh, this time around, I sort of stumbled into it. My um, um, One of my former employees at both Jackson Hewitt and Liberty and I were having a drink uh, after celebrating my sale of uh, Liberty. And he said, uh, you know, I'm a franchise attorney and I have 35 franchises that I represent. And he said, why don't you think about getting out of the tax business? And uh, for example, I have a business that um, very profitable, they, but they've been in been in business. These people can't sell franchises. They've been in business 13 years and only have 13 franchises. Why don't you help other franchisees, developing franchisees like this, uh, expand and grow like you've grown? And so I did. And uh, well, and, and in the meantime, it was a good timing in the sense that I was under my non compete from Liberty Tax. 
So I said, okay, let's try that. And so we embarked on a course to have multiple franchise brands that uh, we bring different things to the table than someone like Neighborly, in my opinion. We have more success in one brand. And I have, uh, for example, in bringing in 5,200 franchises around the country, I have people all over the country that are looking to work with me again. And many of them have sold and left either Jackson Hewitt or H&R Block or Liberty Tax. And uh, we can uh, be their franchise development arm. We, uh, I brought in 5,200 franchises. I'm sure there must be others that have done that. I don't know any. So uh, we can be their development arm. We can mention them. And we have contacts all over the country. So we embarked on a program of multi-brands in, instead of what I'd done before, just focus on one brand. Okay. So do these companies, these brands necessarily have to be uh, related? They're not. Like uh, Zoom and Grooming is, uh, I believe, a, a pet industry right. franchise. And then there's Atax, there's Ledger's. Little medical school that that I don't know. Jam some. Uh, how do they all work? Because the attorney led you to these brands, or the brands have come to well, you and you bring them on. Yeah. Once once um, I started with the brand that he brought to me, then we went out in search of our own brands, okay. and we weren't looking for a pattern or a a group like Neighborly that that just wants household services. We were looking for franchises that were um, there were had integrity that were replicable and that they had some stickiness that that once someone was up and successful and, and profitable that they want would want to stay and grow with the system so we were just looking for franchises that met that mold that were willing to partner with us to help them grow okay so one of the things you said that the attorney told you was that these folks have been franchising for a number of years. They have a dozen franchisees. They're, they're not getting any place fast. Two-thirds, according to the International Franchise Association, two-thirds of franchisors never reach 100 franchise locations. Is that ludicrous? Uh, why do it? Uh, you know, you, you've never been in that situation. <laughs> Yeah, I've, I've learned a lot, a, a valuable lesson in dealing with all the brands uh, that over the last five or six years, I learned this, this valuable lesson. What what happens, John, is, and, and you've been doing this almost as long as me. So if you think about it, this, this is what happens. You have a, a, someone successful in a mom and pop business and uh, other people say to him, or he thinks to himself, you know, this would be a good franchise. Or other people say, why don't you franchise? And so you take this very successful mom and pop who begins to franchise. Well, it costs to start up, it costs a few hundred thousand dollars. So he doesn't have that extra cash lying around. So he needs to keep his permit, his mom and pop business going. And so he's only really franchising kind of part time. And not only is he only franchising part time because he needs his annual income from his mom and pop, but he's not good at it. And the actual, a number that's even more frightening than two thirds never get to a hundred. Today, if you look at all the franchises that belong to the International Franchise Association, almost 4,000, the median, the median to have, to be in the top 50%, all you need is 20 locations. So most franchisors fail. So I, I saw some advice the other day from someone's giving this advice. Uh, here's the advice on franchising. Don't. And most people, most people fail uh, at trying to be a franchisor. Why do you think that is? You've explained some already. They don't have the money. But there have been a lot of franchisors that have become successful and didn't have the money at the time they started. What's, what's the differential in the people who really make it work in spite of their financial situation? It's going to be hard for your listeners to believe this because it's black and white. It's so simple. It goes, it, it's pure common sense. The secret to franchising is simply happy, successful franchisees. And most of them, most franchisors change it to happy, successful franchisor. 
if if you have happy, successful franchisees, you're unstoppable. You'll grow like wildfire. If you don't, if you have un, don't have happy or su- successful both, then you're going to fail. So it, that seems like total common sense to me. But when when I sold one of my companies, I sold Liberty, and they they took Liberty bankrupt five years after I sold it. From a, it went from a half a billion dollar company to bankrupt. Wow. And I had on big letters when you walk in the front door, happy, successful franchisees. Within a month, they whitewashed the wall. So how do you, can you identify who's going to become a happy, successful franchisee before you become their franchisor? Um, uh, no and yes. The key to... to a franchise is, and I've built two of the top 100 largest franchise chains in the country, right? The key that thing you're looking for is, and your key responsibility is to build the best system in the industry. If I do my job as a franchisor, your job is to follow that system. Well, John, out of the 5,200 franchisees that I brought in, guess how many have followed the system 100%? You know, zero. No one listens. And so, um, no, I can't, I can't decide who's going to succeed because everyone tells me they're going to listen. And yet I know they're not going to listen. And so, no, I can't decide because they, I never can tell how much they're going to listen. But yes, each person can decide because it's in their, you know, my favorite, my, the favorite two, 10, two letter words is if it is to be, It is up to me. So they can decide because the people that are massively successful listen 98 or 99 percent. The failures, and I've had I've had a thousand millionaires and a thousand failures. And the failures listen less than 90 percent. Every time you don't listen, it's going to cost you time or money or both. Have you ever used a personality profile? And I say this for a reason because I love the DISC profile. I used it at HomeVestors to identify, uh, to better understand why the top franchisees were top franchisees and the bottom were bottom franchisees. And in our case, top franchisees like your your daughter, who was one of my franchisees and her husband, they had D on the DISC scale, D in their personality. And the bottom 50 franchisees did not have D or had very little D in their personality. Now, that doesn't always ensure that a franchise, a person's going to become a great franchisee because they have the profile that matches um, whatever business a tax or whatever other franchise it might be. Do you give any credence to personality profiling? Pay any attention to that? I I, I don't because at, because at the end of the day, I found it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter your personality. It doesn't matter how smart you are, or educated you are, or experienced you are, and. Sometimes the more experienced or the more successful you are, it actually goes against you because you think you know better than me. And I've been doing this for 54 years. And most people that start this haven't been doing it for 54 hours. What do you say uh, if I wanted, I want to write a book, uh, The Best Franchisees, John Hewitt and I are going to do this. What are we going to put in that book, John? What makes the best franchisee, other than the obvious, Follow the system 100%. Well, we know if you followed it 95%, you'd probably be fairly successful. That's not the only thing that makes a top franchisee or the best franchisee, kind of franchisee that John Hewitt wants in his network. What, what makes that person? Yeah, the, um, when you have a top franchisee, there's still a bandwidth. Right. If you say that one third of the franchisees are top franchisees, well, you still have the person that's at 100 and the person that that's at 67. So now I've, I've gotten to be I'm one of the I listen 98 percent or more. Now, what's the next thing that you need? And I think Tom Watson's senior, one of the original founders of IBM said, give me 100 great engineers or give me 100 people with great attitude. And I'll take the 100 people with great attitude because you can teach engineering. You can't teach attitude. And, John, one of the biggest failures and disappointments in my career is I've never been able to change someone's attitude. So 
the, it starts with, with the attitude and culture. And those are the people that are going to be the most successful, is the people with the, with the, the best attitude. How about bad franchisees, John? Uh, I'm sure you've, you've known some. Can you identify them? Or, and I'm sure you have. This is not somebody I want to sell a franchise to. What are the reasons why you know this is, this is not going to work well for them, not going to work well for us? Well, when a franchisee fails... And remember, the only way they've ever failed is to not follow the system. So it didn't matter where their location was or or it was just not following the system. So whenever a franchisee fails, they can only blame two people, themselves or me. And they always blame me first. Now, most of them get over that and most of them. But I've had failures say, we followed the system 100% and it's not working. And you're horrible, and you did this, and you did that. And we can easily show them. We can easily show them that they're not listening. That here, you didn't do this, you didn't do this, you didn't do this. But, um, yeah, there's, there's, and that's true in, in all walks of life. That there are people that are always blaming others. And, again, the, 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 my favorite ten two-letter words, if it is to be, it is up to me. And if it is to be, it is up to you, Mr. Franchisee. You can't just sit there and wait for things to happen. You you have to you have to be uh, you have to follow the system, and you have to have initiative. There's no one there to tell you to be at work at nine o'clock every day. Yeah. How about the difference between a successful franchisor versus a franchisee? What what's different between those two? You can become a fran- successful franchisor. You can become a successful franchisee by doing certain things. But what, what are the two or three differences that are going to make it clear that you really need to be a franchisor or a franchisee? Well, again, my success has been because, and I have the same philosophy in franchising as I do in a relationship. And, for example, significant other. I don't believe you can go 50% of the way. You know, I don't, I mean, uh, you would, marriage is supposed to be a 50-50 relationship. Yeah. But but you got to go 90-10. Both people got to go way more. And while no franchisee has ever lived up to follow the system, we have always exceeded our responsibility. So I go, we go the extra mile and do more than required. And that's the only way that we can we can manage that relationship successfully is we do way more for them. We treat them, coddle them like infants. Every year, the uh, Fran Data, uh, the International Franchise Association, and others will announce that there's at least a new franchise brand a day being introduced in North America, 400 to 500 new brands a year. Uh, they use that number. There are 4,000 total brands uh, when you and I got started, there were only 2,000. So, it, And nobody really knows these numbers, as, as you know, because we don't have to sign up any place and claim to be a franchisor. But the interesting thing to me is if there are 400, 500 new brands every year, and we're still saying 4,000 total brands, then 400 to 500 brands are failing every year in North America. Is that possible? And explore that a little bit. Why? And surely you want to be, you want to avoid those opportunities or they're not really, they're not good opportunities. Explore that a little bit for us. Yeah. The, uh, again, uh, let me, let me um, expand on what I said before about happy, successful franchisor. So when they go to set up the system, they they set up all these all these things they have they have a technology fee and an application fee and a renewal fee and a tran i mean just fee after fee after fee and they're looking for for them to make money for and the the only way to start and end this successfully is both have to make money if the franchisee makes money and the franchisor doesn't, it's going to fail. And if the franchisor makes money and the franchisee it doesn't, it fails. So the greatest franchisees ensure 
that they get a, a return, a, a excellent return on their investment that includes both time and money. And most are ninety percent plus of franchisors don't bother to under to consider that to sit in the seat of the franchisee and understand that I have to feel good about my investment and I have to be happy with the way I'm treated as in and the way the organization is run and is the the culture in the organization. Most people can't do that. R running a franchise system is not a science. It's an art. It's a relationship. It's not like most people that can run businesses that aren't franchised. They know how to handle employees. You're not dealing with employees. You're dealing with with hundreds and hundreds or, or dozens of different personalities. And they own their own business. So it's a whole different skill set to be able to manage a franchise system. Through the years, there's been a lot of comparison of uh, franchisees are like children and franchisors are the parent and there's the parent-child relationship. A lot of franchisees hate that. They, they don't want to be called children, babies, uh, toddlers. Um, sometimes, you know, some franchisors will say, well, you're now at the teenage stage. You're now at the young adult stage. Is this a good way to talk about franchisees in your opinion? I certainly don't talk about that. I certainly feel that, that, okay. that, uh, when I bring in a franchise, it, it almost feels like I'm bringing in another child into my, into my family. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of people that have said of my companies over the years that it feels like a family. Well, I think it's I think it's a family and a team. It's not just a family. And and while a franchisee ha wears many different possible hats, right? They're a child. They're a team member. They're a customer. Uh, they're a partner. And to me, the to be careful with with the legal connotations of it. But a franchisee is a customer with partnership responsibilities that has to has to just as we have to treat them as a customer and with respect, they have they have certain re responsibilities that they owe us. And so it's it's uh, it, it the the relationship is complex. Do you think franchisors understand the franchisee is the franchisors? Customer? Um, certainly not the ones that fail. Yeah. <laughs> certainly not the ones that fail. And, you know, the an, an interesting concept is that pretend your royalty was 5% and a customer pays $100. Well, the franchisee feels that you're taking $5 of his 100 right? When he should feel that the customer is paying 100 5 goes to the franchisor, and 100 goes, or 95 goes to the franchisee. They do not understand the relationship well, and they do not value what the, uh, just automatically, it's not automatic value that a franchisee gives a franchisor. That, oh yes, uh, we owe you this for X reason. So you have to continually earn their cooperation. Do you uh, think the franchise regulations in America. Is that why franchising is so successful? One of, one of the things about that is I, I say to people who come to me and want to become a franchisor, and I start to explain rules and regulations, and I say, one of the things you're going to have to do is produce your customer list in item 20 of the FDD and tell everybody who your customers are. Name, address, phone number, email address. How do you feel about that? Are these regulations too much? Or are they not enough? I think that um, I'm generally against over-regulation in all of business. And uh, I, think, uh, I think one of the, the, the great, two greatest reasons we have uh, uh, a great company or country is capitalism. And I think over-regulation can hurt capitalism. I do not feel that except at a state-by-state -state 
basis on occasion in some of the registration states. Nationally, I don't feel that we're over-regulated. I'd like you to give some advice to uh, my students and to the Gen Z population, that the group that's in college now. Um, Gen Zs want to become business owners eventually. But of course, just out of college, uh, they may not be ready for that. And financially, they may not be prepared. What kind of advice would you give or two or three points that you'd say the Gen Zs ought to think about as they come out of college? Well, my, my first thought is that, and I have several, but my first thought is that um, my saying is find something you love to do, work hard, persevere. And secondly, I'll say that the greatest way to create wealth in the world is not by working for someone else, it's by working for yourself. And that's been proven that if you go to the the richest Americans, the Fortune 500, almost everyone, if not everyone, was a, a business owner. They didn't make it by by being a, a athlete or a, a movie star. They made it by, by owning businesses. On the other hand, two-thirds of the country want to be self-employed, but only about half of them, a third of the country, can be self-employed because they don't have the risk tolerance or the self-starting drive to be on their own. And so you have to be careful. I, I mean, I love what uh, being an entrepreneur has done for my life and my uh, my children and great-grandchildren and grandchildren and great-grandchildren's life. I love how it's and how I've affected so many people. But I've also seen people that fail that can't do it. So uh, again, I'll go back to the basics. Find something you love to do, work hard, persevere. On Monday morning, if you're going to work and you're not looking forward to it, you're going to the wrong place. Mm. If, if you think, thank God it's Friday, you're in the wrong place because thank God it's Monday. Mm. How long does this take to find something that you like to do? And how do Gen Zs do that? They're, they're kids, they're in college, they're studying, uh, they're, they're experimenting with all kinds of things that are going on in the world. How would you suggest they go find that something that they're going to say, this is what I want to do? You knew that tax preparation was your thing very early in life. Uh, not everybody could, could experience that. Exactly. And, and I interview people of all ages. And, and kind of, I've interviewed thousands of people. My favorite question is, what do you want to be when you grow up? And most people, if they're even 20, 30, 40, 50, they don't know what they want to be when they grow up. Mm -hmm. So I was blessed to find out very early. And I'll take you back to a study that was done almost 70 years ago at, at Yale or Princeton, where they looked at all the graduates and 90% of the, no, um, yeah, 90 of the graduates went out and got a job. And 10% went and just fooled it, did something they either, they either worked in a business they're, 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 uh, or they, they started the business or they toured Europe or something. And they find it. And 25 years later, they got them together. And the 10% that had gone and done something else had a higher net worth than the 90% that went out and got a job. So instead, so my, my, um, Advice would be, you're, when you graduate college, you're, most people will tell you, everyone around you will say, get a good job, especially your parents. I mean, get a good job. You need to start making money. But my, I, I challenge you to find something you love to do, even if you're like Rich Dad, Poor Dad. And, and Rich Dad made him work for nothing. Remember? And he said, this is the best lesson he ever learned yeah. that in Rich Dad, Poor Dad, that he went down from 10 cents an hour down to nothing. He said, because you need to learn. And that that lesson was more valuable than any lesson he had ever had in his life. So instead of looking for a job and it's not it's OK to look for a job, but keep in mind, you're looking for the the, the path, the career, the joy in life. Years ago, Harvard did a study that determined most Americans do not 
set goals. And those are not New Year's resolutions. Goals are in writing with an action plan. How am I going to get from here to where that goal says I should be or I want to be in one year or five years or whatever it might be? People don't put timelines on their goals. They don't really have goals. In franchising, isn't it important for franchisors and franchisees to have goals? And should we be teaching people, particularly franchisees, how to have goals? Well, I'm with you. I agree that, that you should have goals in, in any, in all parts of your life. You should have personal goals and business goals. And uh, it's if, if you don't know where you're going, then, then you could be going in the exact opposite direction. Hmm. So, yes, uh, I'm very, 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 um, uh, I'm uh, very intense on setting a goal. We set a five-year goal, then back it down to three year, and then back it down to one year. And do you teach your franchisees to do goal setting in a formal way? We require them at training when they come to initial training okay. to to leave with a three year to, to leave with a three year goal yeah. and uh, a plan. Mm -hmm. As a franchisor, John, do you sell franchises or do you award franchises? What I tell my people, my and and again, I brought in fifty two hundred franchisees, so I've been extraordinarily. Uh, successful in changing tens of thousands of people's lives because they have hundreds of thousands of employees. But what, what I tell people is your job isn't to sell anyone anything. Your job is to find me the right person. If you find the right person, then I will, I will get them on board. Your job is to bring me the right person, identify the right person. And so we have a list of things. Is the person meant to be self-employed? Is this the right industry? Is this the right vehicle? Is this the right time? And we look for the right person. Now, we, it's, it, it can't be good to, to sell someone on something that they're not good at. They're, again, when the franchisee fails, it's, they're going to blame me. So there's no joy in that. And what do you think about that, those philosophies, the sell versus award? Selling is, okay, maybe I'm forcing it on you or enticing you into it. Awarding is this idea that there are only so many franchises we can sell in our network, and we're going to award one to you. Yeah, I think that most most people, and even in the industry, don't don't think of it this way. That let's pretend that the, there's a franchise in Virginia Beach of any franchise system. There's only one franchise, and there's thousands of people that could get this franchise. So surprise. It's a prize, right? And and when it's not something that that you're paying me for, you don't you don't leave. It's not like a car where you you write a check and leave the showroom and I don't see you ever again. It's we're going to spend many years together, so you want to make sure it's right for that person. And it's just a waste of of it's waste of my time, your time, and we're not we're not doing a good job for the market if we don't bring the right person. So it's identification of the right person and presenting the opportunity to them properly. One of my uh, great heroes and a mentor in franchising, the late Don Dwyer, founder of what is now Neighborly, and we give the Don Dwyer Memorial Scholarship at the Titus Center. It was uh, funded by his six children some years ago. And he used to say, if you're not selling a franchise today, you're not doing your job as CEO of the franchisor. What do you think about that? Are you selling franchises every day? Everything is marketing. You know, when, when you say that, people think of, you say marketing, and people think, well, that's a TV ad or a radio ad or a, uh, now it's an internet ad. But everything you do is marketing, whether it's sitting on this podcast or the color that you paint your building or your your uh, the walls or... The, who you hire and how you train, every single thing is marketing. So if those people that are really great at their occupation are doing it um, just by everything that they do in life. Do you use franchise brokers? And what do you think about the, uh, the you know, it used to be no one used brokers. They didn't exist. And for many years after the brokers came onto the market, franchisors resisted because they were going to give up so much of their franchise fee. Uh, but 
franchise brokers or consultants are much more popular today. How about you? Where do you stand on them? Over the years, in the, out of the 5,200 franchisees I brought in, maybe 300 or 400 came from franchise brokers. Mm -hmm. Most of the time we do it internally. And is there a reason for that? Do you, are, are brokers not as good at finding candidates for your half dozen or more uh, franchise brands? Or are you prefer to well, do it that I, way? I, yeah, I try not to be negative but um, on anything. But um, I have, this is a negative connotation that as a franchise broker, typically they'll have a couple hundred brands. And so they have a franchise candidate come to them and they they represent hundreds of brands. And the theory is that they're going to put you with the best brand. Well, the, the broker gives them a certain amount. They're going to make X number of dollars on each transaction. X percent of the franchise, the X percent of the people that apply for this franchise are approved. And so you're going to get more money, more approval, more. And so in in all human nature, there's a bias. There's a bias that the, the broker, theoretically, they're doing the best job for you, but they're biased to get paid the most. So um, I, I find that to be a, a negative that they there are some some that will go and do the best job for every candidate and some will bias them and and they'll do let's say they brought in 50 people uh, out of 500 brands or 200 brands then 30 of them go to this one brand well that can't be right mm -hmm. right they're just biased so yeah. i find them to be i find on occasion for them to be biased so i like my own people who um, are trained to do what's best for every person. And uh, every person has to meet me. So I get to decide if, if it's the right person for our, our organization. Mm -hmm. Many people want to become franchise brokers today because they see it as very lucrative. You can become a broker, depending on which brand you join, the broker or consultant brand that you join, it may cost you $25,000 to get in and to get some training. But people who've never owned a franchise can be brokers. And people uh, out of college who don't have a lot of real world experience become brokers. And the government doesn't regulate the brokerage or franchise consulting business. Is there something wrong there? Is, do we need to improve what's happening in that brokerage uh, industry? I certainly um, see them. Uh, one of the reasons franchisors make mistakes or, or fail is because they only have brokers and they aren't, they aren't getting referred the right people. So um, I, again, I'm against overregulation, but I believe that some minimum requirements should, should exist for uh, franchise brokers for sure. If, if they've never been in business themselves, and they, they're never, because they have represent so many brands, they can't be complete, completely knowledgeable about all the brands. So I, I find that to be a, um, something that, that could be improved. Yes. You talked about the importance of building a system for happy and successful franchisees. And I'm wondering if you could elaborate how does a franchisor create the system that's going to be for happy and successful franchisees? What are the two or three things they must do as the franchisor to know that that's going to occur? Well, I invented, well, first of all, I understand this, that there's no system that exists today that's going to be, the, even if it's the best, that's going to be the same 10 years from now and still be best. If you're not improving, your competitors gaining on you. So I invented what we do at our convention is pretty unique. I'm sure that others may do it, or uh, but certainly not the majority do it. M most franchisors believe they should know how to do it, and they should teach the franchisees how to do it. Well, what I believe is the franchisees are an incredible resource of knowledge of what the customer needs. And I, while I have been doing this 54 years and know the big picture, better than anyone in this industry, in, in the tax industry, for example. My franchisees are on the ground doing tax returns with customers. 
And so at our convention, we break into about 20 different breakout groups, uh, marketing and tech software and support, uh, tech support, tech support, and say, we, we get on a board and say, tell us how to improve. And we write everything down, the Dale Carnegie way. And at the end of the, the uh, convention, after the convention, the executives meet with franchise representatives and we decide what are we going to improve this year? What are we going to improve sometime in the future? And what are we not going to improve? And uh, we're, I'm proud to say that every year, more than 50% of the ideas are implemented. So our franchisees are our creator. Uh, and so the, the only way to improve, to, the only way to have a great system is to be imp constantly improving. And the only easy way to improve is to listen to the people that are dealing with the customers. John, if you're introspective for a moment, why are you so competitive? You know, I, I don't know the reason for that. Well, I've, I've, been, I've been competitive from the, the longest, my longest memory. I was, you know, I, and, and to me, it's, it's show me a, a, lo a good loser and I'll show you a loser. It's a, I am, I am a fierce competitor and I don't know how I got that way. I was just, I think I was born that way. How about growing up? Did people tell you, gee, you're not going to achieve this. You can't do that. Uh, was it a matter of, uh, well, I'll show you someday. I'm, I'm going to be wealthy. Yeah, in, in Kathy Lee Gibbard's book, she says that till you're about seven or eight, uh, you think you can do anything. You can be president of the United States. You can be an astronaut. You can be Superman, Superwoman. And he said, but everyone beats you down. You're not only your friend, not only your enemies, but your teachers, your parents, your friends. You can't do that. You can't do that. And she calls it the age of bliss. And I realized one of the differences between me and normal people is they never beat me down. I always, I was blessed. One of my blessings is they never beat me down. I always thought I could do anything. And so um, most people have to get back into that age of bliss and that positive attitude. But I've, I've lived it. So that's one of my many blessings. One of your passions is to help people. And what a great job or opportunity being a franchisor. You're going to help people. Our uh, one, one of, I know you would admire Zig Ziglar. I worked with Zig Ziglar, was a speaker for the Ziglars for a period of time. And Zig would say, you can have everything in life you want if you'll just help enough other people get what they want. Is there anything better than franchising to help people get what they want and teaching as well? And I've been blessed to be in both of those areas. Well, why is that a passion for you to help people? You know, I've always, I've always felt that way. And I think that, well, that I learned that from my parents, that my parents were incredibly giving. I learned that, that, uh, and one of the things that, that, that drives me is I always want to do for more for everyone than they do for me. And I, and I always want what's best for each person and what's best for each person isn't always best for me, but it's, I want what's best for each and every individual. And I think that's the number one power behind my success is caring about each and every person and trying to improve their lives and make them all be all they can be. In the process, you've made millionaires through your 5,200 plus franchisees. A thousand or thousands of them have become millionaires in, in one or more of your businesses. How do you feel about the failures, they, they lost money, in fact. They, they left the business with less money than they had when they came in. How, how do you figure into that? What, what do you say about those scenarios? You, you know, my favorite Shakespeare is, um, uh, this above all, to thine own self be true. And I have to do what's right. And I, if I give you the best system, I'm relentless in, and I quickly see that you're not listening. We... We, and for example, your first tax season, we don't wait until April 15th to tell you're failing because we know how many tax returns you're supposed to do every day from January 1st until April 15th. So along about January 12th or 15th or 20th, you're not on plan, we send you an email. And then a, a week later, if you're not on plan, we call you. And then a couple of weeks later, you're not on plan, we come and see you. So I'm going to be the most annoying person 
at trying to get you to follow the system. But if you don't listen, and I told you over and over again, we told you over and over again at every step of the way. So yeah, if you don't listen, then I, I can't help you. And you're not listening. So what I tell what I tell people if you're not listening is there's some place that God meant for you to be extraordinary. This isn't the place. You need to go find somewhere else you can be extraordinary. But do you notice that uh, at We Buy Ugly Houses, I would frequently call the top or the I would frequently call the bottom 20 franchisees and in some cases beg them to let me resell their their territory or help them get out of the franchise. And they they said that I was a bad franchisor, that the system sucked, that nothing worked the way I promised. And I would say, given all of that, uh, why don't you help let me help you out of the system? Never happened. Nobody ever agreed to that. They wanted to stay in the system. Why is that? Why do bad franchisees want to stay? Or not bad, unsuccessful franchisees want to stay? You know, I I can't, what I tell people is I can't get in the cesspool of how those people think. I can't even imagine how they think. I mean, it's beyond my comprehension, as, as I'm sure it is, as you're alluding to. I mean, the person's not following the system. They're not making any money. And they say, no, no. And, and oftentimes, John, they'll say, well, give me another chance and I'll listen. And they don't. So it, it's beyond my comprehension. And I don't try to get into the, I don't try to get into their minds and figure out how they think. I try to change their, I try to get them to sell the franchise. And we set performance minimums. So in our, we learned because of those kind of people, after a few years, we set performance standards. So after your first year, you have to do X amount of revenue. After your second year, you have to buy the, by year three, if you're not doing X, we have the right to terminate you. Mm-hmm. Because um, we found that, that people were failing wouldn't leave. Yeah. And why is it that people will do their due diligence or say that they did about your franchise opportunity and they'll put up money, maybe uh, $50,000, maybe $150,000 uh, more that they're investing and then they don't follow the system. They don't listen to you. What is it about human nature that says, put up all this money, $300,000, and kiss it goodbye? You're not going to follow our system, and you're going to fail. Well, it's just human nature. People people learn from birth not to, not to listen, right? And I don't know how if you have children, but we've all been, those listeners that have children, but we've all been children. And I know lots of times I didn't listen to my parents. And they had they had great advice. We're born, we're born as cocky know it alls, thinking that we know better. And I see. I mean, my, I've had a grandchild grab a a, a burner on a stove. I mean, the just do people do stupid things. It's just it's just human nature. It's and and to follow a system goes against all all human instincts. Does John Hewitt owe? a franchisee success the um if it is to be it is up to them so i owe them giving them uh, the best system in the industry and to if they get off track or when they get off track to uh, support them to to explain to them how they need to get on track and follow the proven system our system works coast to coast it works in United States works in Canada, and your job is just to implement the system. That's all I owe them is is the the greatest system, in and and to police the system and make sure that everyone follows the system so that we have a a high rate of exceeding customers' expectations. And do you owe them outstanding training and support as well? Absolutely. That's that's part of any great system is is an important part, is an incredibly important part, is training and ongoing training. So if you're going to buy a franchise and you can only do one thing to determine which franchise to buy, and maybe that's not possible, but let's say it is, what is that? 
What's the thing, the number one thing you've got to consider before you buy a franchise? Well, unfortunately, as you said there, as you pointed out, there are people that are happy even when they're not making money. And so you can't call people and ask them whether they're happy. You have to, what you have to ensure is that people are happy or, or are satisfied with the return on investment for their time and money. And it's not just money, right? Because uh, it's how much time you invested in it. So when you talk to franchisees or look at franchisees, did they get a satisfactory return on their time and their money? It's not the only thing that I think uh, someone should do before buying a franchise, but I tell prospective franchisees, the first thing to do is forget about reading the FDD, call 10 franchisees and ask them some questions. And as you pointed out, you can't ask them if they're happy because that's not going to give you necessarily the answer that you want. But will franchisees lie to prospective franchisees? Franchisees lie to themselves, right? So, and that's one of the reasons that people will stay even if they're losing money, is they're lying to themselves, that it's somehow it's going to change and get better and so forth. So if they'll lie to themselves, they'll certainly, they'll certainly mislead a potential franchisee. Today, there's a lot of talk at uh, the IFA and online social media about this concept of responsible franchising which uh, I guess we haven't always been doing. I would agree that some franchisors, some franchisees, uh, you could not credit them with responsible franchising, whatever that is. What does that mean to you, responsible franchising? Have you thought about that concept? Again, it mean, what it means to me is any franchisor that does not understand that they need happy, successful franchisees. So that if, if they don't get that, if they don't understand that the only way that they can win is if you win as a franchisee, then that's why they fail. And they're going to fail. I wrote a book with the co-founder of Subway, Fred DeLuca, Start Small, uh, Finish Big. And one of the things that I discovered in the mornings when I would get together with uh, Fred to work on the book, he always brought his laptop. And while we were having breakfast, he was always into a spreadsheet. And um, one day I asked him, Fred, what do you look at every morning on that spreadsheet? And he said, there were three numbers that I watch every day that help me determine whether or not we're on track as a corporation or we're not. How closely do you pay attention to numbers? And can you talk, if so, can you talk about those numbers? What are they? They're different in each industry, but everyone Every business, every business CEO, they need to know every day, three to five numbers. Three is a nice number. If, if these three things are in alignment, then you're going to be successful. And you don't need a hundred different numbers or because you can overanalyze and get into so, too much garbage. But in, and so in, in the tax preparation business, it's, it's simply the number of tax returns the average fee, and the number of payroll hours. Those three things. If you know them every day, then you don't, the rest all fits in, right? The, the rest, the rest is all minutia and the change. Okay. The rest is all minutia yeah. and changes. So it's three, three things. It's, it's number of tax returns, the, the fee per tax return, mm -hmm. and the number of payroll hours per tax return. So every franchisor needs to boil that down. What are the three, and it doesn't have to necessarily be three, but what are the three numbers you need to watch to know if your franchisees are on track and they're going to become happy franchisees? It's not just in franchising, it's every business. Every business needs to come down to, to some key factors so you can know every day, every hour, how you're doing. How closely do you watch EBITDA and why is that so important? Again, if, if the, the major numbers are in line, then I'm going to get to the, a decent EBITDA. So I, we have our, I mean, we have our annual budgeting and our, our monthly budgeting and our reports and, and we're constantly on top of it. But what, what I look at is actually is cash in the bank at the end of every day. How about flat fee versus royalty? Have you ever used a flat fee? I'm assuming you, you, 
you don't you prefer royalty over a flat fee? Yeah, I've dabbled in everything to try to improve. Uh, so there isn't in 54 years, there isn't much that I haven't seen or tried. Um, but the problem with flat fee is it, it totally you lose on inflation. So you, um, it, it becomes, it becomes irrational after a certain period of time. So you, because of inflation, you have to have a fee that's, that's, uh, variable. Are you going to go public again, John, with a franchise concept? Probably not. I, I think as as we spin off some of our companies, as you know, I'm s- almost 75 years old, so we will be spinning off companies. And as we spin them off, they may go public. But I, but I've been CEO of two public companies, and boy, with Sarbanes Oxley, it's such a nuisance and so expensive. Uh, it at uh, you know, when at Jackson Hewitt, Sarbanes Oxley didn't exist, but with Liberty, it did. And at the end, it was even the expense, three and a half million a year, just to follow the Sarbanes Oxley uh, pronouncements. So, no, I'm not. I'm not going to take loyalty public. I don't think. And just uh, again, some advice to uh, young people. You've already said, uh, new college graduates, go go find something that you're going to be passionate about, something that you really want um, to do. One of the stumbling blocks for them, and 95% of my Gen Z students want to own their own business. How do they get the money when they're 21, 25 years old? Well, if, if you are part of a great organization, uh, a great franchise. What I tell people is to be successful in business. You need two things: you need you need leader you need leadership, a person, and you need money. It's a lot easier for me to get money than it is for me to find the right people. So what I tell people in my systems is: you come and work for me for a year. You prove yourself. I'll get you the money. So a great franchisor, go work in the system, and you'll either find the franchisor or one of the franchisees will fund you. They will come to, if you're good enough and, and you're a high quality person, people will be begging to sponsor you, to to work with you, to help, help build your franchise. So that's why I say find something you love to do because if you work hard and do a good job in any virtually any industry, you'll find the money in that industry to support you. Thanks for tuning in to the Franchise Hot Seat Podcast with Dr. John P. Hayes. Tune in next time for more conversation around all things franchising.